Hello everyone, welcome to the Durham household. My name is Gerard Durham, and right next to me is my wife Nadine. Directly in front of me is Rachel, and next to Rachel is Sarah. Hey everyone, welcome to the Greater Philadelphia Church of Christ Sunday service. Um, I'll be reading the scripture. Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. Know that the Lord is God. It is he who made us and we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Um, enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. For the Lord is good and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. Hi, good morning, everyone. I'm so happy to be here um, to share with you on Resurrection Sunday. Um, a few years ago, I had an opportunity to travel to Israel for work of, um, a few times um, and actually was able to go to Jerusalem. And as you can imagine, it was a very um, emotional and very fulfilling experience to be able to go um, and, you know, to be able to go where the disciples were and to go where Jesus walked. Um, there are two pictures I wanted to share with you that um, capture two very emotional um, moments for me while I was there. The first one is actually a picture of me sitting in front of the, the tomb. Um, and when I went into the, the tomb, it was a very emotional experience for me, as you can imagine, just being where, um, you know, Jesus' body was laid, you know, after he died. Um, and before he was resurrected, to know that, that that's where he was. And I thought about the unconditional love, I thought about the gift of the cross, I thought about um, God's love for each and every one of us while I was there. Um, the second picture was taken actually on one of our last mornings. We took a sunrise bike tour, and where we ended up was um, at a building, on top of a building where um, that was above where the Last Supper took place. And because it was morning, it was very silent. It was very somber. There were lots of people praying. There was, you know, lots of people singing, um, um, you know, from various different um, backgrounds. Um, and as we were there, the sun just sort of popped up, right, um, amongst the trees and um, below the clouds. And it was over where the Garden of Gethsemane was, um, where the Mount of Olives were. And I was overcome with emotion thinking about just how that, to me, at the moment, rep represented the resurrection. That um, it represented Jesus being no longer here on earth, no longer here in pain, being with God. Um, and it was just a beautiful moment for me to think about that that's my destination. This is where I want to be and that we all can be as disciples and followers um, of Jesus. Um, and it was a promise, a promise of this is where we um, all as disciples can be um, one day with God in heaven as well. Nadine, thanks for sharing that. And have a great rest of the service today. And on behalf of the Durham household, Happy Easter! I'm Zach Fazio, and today we have some great news coming out of the churches in Brazil. Miriam has been a disciple since the mid-90s and has always dreamed of being united with her mother in Christ. About 26 years after her baptism, on January 15th, 2021, that dream was realized when her mother, Aristea, was baptized into Christ. On February 8th of this year, Jeff and Amanda Henderson from San Antonio, Texas, along with their three children, moved to lead the campus students in the west sector of Sao Paulo, Brazil. The Brazilians are grateful for the help of their brothers and sisters in the U.S. In 2020, a woman named Corrine was invited to church. In time, she invited 10 friends to come along with her. Later, they invited 20 more people to church. Altogether, she and three of her friends were baptized into Christ. All glory to God. Before the pandemic, Marcelo, a former pastor from another church, began studying the Bible with members of our church in Sao Paulo. Through God's grace, he decided to be baptized and today lives as a disciple of Jesus Christ. We praise God for his work in the churches in Brazil. Thank you for joining us for this Good News Minute. God bless.
while we turned away from him, he turned his heart toward us. While we chased after selfish desires, he chased after us. While we made excuses for our misguided choices, pursuing an elusive sense of fulfillment, he emptied himself to take the form of a servant. This unthinkable inequity, our Creator clothed in flesh and weakness for the sake of those clothed in iniquity. While we were lost and alone, He became a path for us. While we embraced the comfort of falsehood, He embraced us and showed us truth. While we were eclipsed in shadow, our spirits broken and dying, He became life and light to all. Our shepherd, our teacher, our savior and king. And when it seemed the world had given up, he gave up everything. At just the right time, when we were powerless, he displayed his power and purpose. While we stood accused, he accepted the accusation. He endured humiliation and the untold suffering of crucifixion. For while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Not because we deserved it, far from it, but because there has never been a greater love than the love of Jesus. Today, if you feel hopeless, He gives hope unconditionally. If you've been rejected, He accepts you completely. If your burdens weigh heavy, lay your fears and failures at the foot of the cross, for His blood has erased them entirely. No longer a slave, but an heir of salvation, you are His child, His chosen. You are His beloved. Hello, my name is Todd Shuck, and this is my lovely wife, Michelle. Good morning, everyone. And we're sitting here in the Biblical Gardens at Magnolia Plantation near Charleston, South Carolina. And we're here to talk about being beloved by God. We often fail to see ourselves as God sees us. Now, both Michelle and I grew up knowing of God, but we really didn't know God completely. And we really didn't comprehend the extent of his love for us. Now, he had been pursuing us since our beginning, and we only realized it we no longer had answers and we had a void that we felt and then couldn't quite figure out what was missing so we started searching god guided our steps to find him despite the distractions and challenges of challenges of the world around us since finding him we have felt his abundance of love and many blessings as he has received that we've received especially the blessing of each other though we deeply love each other family and our friends this doesn't compare to the depth of love that God has for us. My heart is filled with love for Todd, but it is only a speck compared to the love that God has for me. And so we'll read today from Romans chapter 8, verses 38 through 39. For I am persuaded that not even death or life, angels or rulers, things present or things to come, hostile powers, height or depth, or any other created thing will have the power to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Have a blessed worship. Thank you. Bye-bye. And my name is Julia and I want to share how God showed how much he loves me the way he preserved me. The scripture I would like to share is Luke 8 14 and it says, The seed that fell among storms stand for those who hear, but as they go on their way, they are choked by life worries riches and pleasures and they do not mature while i was studying the bible with two lovely sisters i was going through a situation with my ex-boyfriend and studying at the same time i was lost confused and choked because i didn't know if god would love me and forgive me for all my craziness i was going through i wanted a pleasure instead of god's love but actually that wasn't what god wanted me to have he wanted me to be loved by him, to learn of him. So one day another sister read this scripture to me 
and I realized that no matter what I was going through, he would be there for me and I would be loved by him. As of this day, he still show his love for me. Thank you so much for letting me share. So when I think about how God has pursued me in love, I immediately go back to when I first started studying the Bible. I was a freshman in college with a very religious background. And I assumed that I was going to take over campus and make a difference because of everything I knew about the Bible. And luckily, I ran into Noah Mata and Kurt Flinchbog, and I was able to study the Bible with them. And in that first study, they showed me that I knew nothing about the Bible. Absolutely nothing. They wrecked me. And I decided I want to know more. So I started studying the Bible with them. And each study got better and better until we reached sin. And I was met with two decisions. I could either get open about my sin and expose it, or I could run away from it and keep it all to myself. Well, I chose to keep it to myself. And I told Kurt, listen, Kurt, I'm going to figure this out on my own. Don't you worry. I did not figure it out by myself or on my own at all. I decided to go back to my old way of living, my old life in the old traditions of my church. But something interesting happened. Every single time I read the Bible, every single time that I prayed, every single time I went to a worship sermon, uh, worship service, or uh, just listen to worship music, the only thing that was on my mind was, you need to study the Bible again. You need to get open about your sin. And everywhere I turned, that was the only thing on my mind. was getting open and having a real relationship with God and studying again. I could not get away from it, no matter how hard I tried. And I immediately thought about Psalm 139, where it says, Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me. Your right hand will hold me fast. If I say, surely the darkness will hide me and the light become night around me, even the darkness will not be dark to you. The night will shine on the day for darkness is as light to you. I was trying to run away from God when none of us can run away from God. He is always there. He was knocking so hard for me to open the door and have a relationship. And yet I refuse. And it took me having a severe mental hardship for me to realize that I need to have a relationship. I need to fix this. And I ended up calling Kurt and saying, listen, I would do whatever it takes to get open with you. And I ended up on his couch one Saturday morning exposing all of my sin and telling him how much I hated myself. And I was expecting him to hate me back. I was expecting him to look at me with disgust, telling me to get out of his home. And yet I was met with something completely different. I turned to look at Kurt and this man was crying. And he looked at me and said, Sonny, I don't hate you. I love you. God love you. I was completely blown away because that's not the response that I thought I was supposed to receive. But that's what God wanted to tell me, that he loved me. And in that moment when I realized that, man, nothing can separate me from this man's love, that God loves me so much, even despite everything that I've done, I knew I needed to have a relationship with him. And after that, I pursued God with everything I had. And no matter what obstacle came against me, I jumped over it to have a relationship with him. And on December 10, 2017, I became a disciple. And it was all because God pursued me with such amazing love. Happy Easter. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. 
Good morning and welcome to the Greater Philadelphia Church of Christ, our live stream Resurrection Sunday service. I want to welcome you as our honored guests and our brothers and sisters from all over that are joining us. It is great uh, to have you with us on this incredible day. For today is the day that so many celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And I want to welcome you. Uh, to our service. My name is Chip Mitchell. I serve as the lead evangelist along with my wonderful wife, Ruby Mitchell. And uh, it is great to be gathered here, though it is digital, but our hearts are united through God's spirit. And it is awesome to be together. And we're celebrating today that incredible thing that took place 2000 years ago, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And, uh, Boy, is that a powerful moment in history, a game changer for all of us, for every one of us. You know, you look at the tomb and that tomb was empty. Uh, the empty tomb. I mean, what a celebration uh, for us as disciples of Jesus Christ, for that is the gateway for us to enter into the glory land way to be with God in heaven. You know, who are we to Jesus? We are the beloved. We are the ones that he gave his life for. And Jesus demonstrated uh, the uh, extent to which he would go by giving his life on the cross, shedding his blood, that through that blood we may have forgiveness of sins, redemption with God, to be adopted as sons and daughters into God's kingdom, and we are ever thankful for that. Today's title is entitled, Beloved. 
Let's go to our Father in prayer as we begin. Father, thank you for the extension of love, the extension of your grace and your mercy, which you've given to us through Christ. Uh, we are honored, though many only celebrate the resurrection on this day, we celebrate it daily in knowing that we can have a resurrected life that is pleasing unto you only because of Christ. God be with us today as we come together in song and in prayer and diving into your word, lift our hearts and our minds as we worship you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, amen, and it's great uh, to be with you uh, this morning. As uh, many of you know, we've been working through the book of Mark for a year now. Uh, but today we are going to deviate away from that, and we're going to jump into the book of John. And we're going to look at a segment here in the scriptures in John chapter 21, uh, after the resurrection of Jesus. Jesus had uh, uh, resurrected at this point, and uh, we, we see him gather with the disciples. And uh, it's about a couple of weeks after the resurrection, and Jesus appears a few times, and now he appears uh, to the uh, apostles on the shore. And they're having a meal together, and at the end of the meal, Jesus engages in conversation with Peter. And it's, it's a powerful uh, interaction that uh, Jesus really brings to light uh, what's most important, and that is love. So let's jump on into the Word as we look at John chapter 21, beginning in verse 15. When they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, and mind you, he calls him Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? So here are the disciples, they're, they're gathered around, Jesus is on the shore, he miraculously appears, uh, and Jesus is having a meal with them. They've got fish that they miraculously caught. And uh, Jesus is at the end of this meal, and he looks to uh, Peter, and he calls him Simon. And he says, Simon, uh, let me ask you a question. Do you love me more than these? Now, you, you, you hear this question, and you're like, oh, man, what is it? are there favorites? Uh, uh, yes, Jesus, it's okay to have Jesus to be your favorite. But he asked him, do you love me more than these? Now, mind you, a few verses before this, as we read in John chapter 21, verse 7, they were out fishing on the boat. Uh, Jesus miraculously enables them to catch fish. And uh, John says, hey, that's Jesus on the shoreline. And what happens? Well, in verse 7, it says, then the disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, it's the Lord. As soon as Simon Peter heard, heard him say, it is the Lord. He wrapped his outer garment around him, for he had taken it off, and jumped into the water. The other disciples followed in the boat, towing the net full of fish, for they were not far from shore, about a hundred yards. So, you know, Peter, when he finds out it's Jesus on the shoreline, what does he do? I mean, he jumps out of the boat. He's the only one to jump out of the boat, and he swims some hundred yards to get to Jesus. They, they have a phenomenal meal of fish. And then after the meal, Jesus asked him the question, do you love me more than these? Well, you know, Peter's the one that jumped out on the boat. He was the one that was eager to get to Jesus more so than the others. But Jesus asked him this question, do you love me? Well, how does Peter respond? He says, yes, Lord, he said, you know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, take care of my sheep. Verse 17, the third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time, do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my sheep. Verse 18, very truly I tell you, when you were younger, you dressed yourself and went where you wanted. But when you were old, you will stretch out, when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and lead you where you do not want to go. 
Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. Then he said to him, what? Follow me. You know, this is an interesting uh, interaction here. They, they have a meal, and, and, and Jesus asked Peter three times, do you love me? And each of those times, Peter responds with, Lord, you, you know all things. You know. You know I love you. And it, it's an interesting question. You know, when you, when you dig deeper, many know this. Jesus, you know, he's asking the question, and what does he say? Do you love me? And he uses this word agape. And uh, this is one of four different words that are used uh, throughout the Bible with regards to love. And agape is this love, this selfless love, this sacrificial love, this unconditional love. It's the highest of the four uh, uh, words that describe love in the scriptures. And Jesus uses this one when he speaks to Peter and he says, he says, do you love me? Do you agape me? Uh, do you have this selfless, unconditional love for me? That's how, what he asks Peter. And how does Peter respond? Peter says, you know that I love you, but he uses a different word, a second of four words that are used for love. And this one is phileo. And it simply if you were to translate it, it literally means God, Jesus says, do you love me? Do you agape me? And literally Peter responds by saying, you know, I am your friend. Wow. That's different. Wait, Jesus says, do you love me? And he uses the highest form of love, but yet Peter comes back with literally the lowest form of love and says, you know, I am your friend. Literally this phileo Friendship is a conditional friendship. It's a cordial. It's, it's a conditional one. Jesus says, do you love me with this unconditional love that I exhibited to you on the cross? Now, mind you, he's resurrected from the dead, showing this unconditional love. And now he says, do you love me unconditionally? And then Peter comes back, well, you know, Lord, I am your friend. I have a conditional love for you. And, you, you know... <laughs> You got to ask yourself the question, you know, Jesus comes back three times and then he literally says, are you even my friend? And Peter is hurt because Jesus has asked him three times. Well, why? Well, we see Peter, uh, we know that Peter denied Jesus and uh, <laughs> Jesus, Peter says, you know, I'm your friend, but yet he felt it. Why? Because the three times uh, reminded him of that night where he betrayed Jesus. And when he was there by the fire and there were a number of people around that did not believe in Jesus, that did not follow Jesus, that did not acknowledge him as the Christ. He's, he's amongst all of them as Jesus is on trial and he's confronted with this idea do you even, you know this guy? Do you know him? Are you a friend of his? And he literally says, I don't know the man. Not even the lowest form of love of being a conditional friend. He says, I don't even know him. And, and so much so that he called down curses on himself. And you gotta wonder, I mean, what is Peter feeling at this moment? Here they are, it's a uh, glorious moment because Jesus has risen from the dead. I mean, he's back. And, and now he's, he's sitting amongst the disciples, now what? And here's Jesus having an intimate conversation with the apostles, and he's asking Peter about the things that have transpired. And, and boy, this is... This is a tough moment. You know, Peter's feeling it. We know as we read the scriptures that that night Peter went out and wept bitterly. He, he was distraught about how he had responded. And now here's Jesus, resurrected Lord, and he's saying, am I even your friend, man? And you, you gotta wonder, whoa, Peter's feeling it. But why, there's, there's guilt in light of how he responded. 
uh, to Jesus in light of how he's responded to this unconditional love that has been lavished out on him and the others, this unconditional love that Jesus exuded while going to the cross. The, the, and, and yet now Jesus is asking, hey, am I even your friend? And Peter knows how wrong he was. You know, it's a, it's a tough moment because Jesus asks, do you love me? And, I, and that's a fair question for all of us. Uh, do you love me? Do you love me unconditionally? You know, I, I love this caption. It seems like the wife is asking the husband, I, I don't need him to be great just better than the other kids we know. And, you know, this really sends a message of, you know, our standard can't be those that are around us. You know, our standard of godliness or faith or love for God and Christ can't be determined by those that are around us. You know, if, if, if that's our, our level of commitment, then it only goes as high as those that are around us. The standard of our commitment is Jesus. The standard of our love and our faith is Jesus. That's who we compare ourselves to, not to those that are around us. For Jesus is the standard. Jesus is the one that we follow. And we see that Peter had a problem with this. Why? You know, uh, Peter stayed too close to the crowd. Wherever the crowd was, you know, he generally... Uh, stayed with that. Whatever that standard was, that's kind of where he lived. You know, we see that when uh, they were in the garden. And all, when all the disciples fled, Peter fled as well. You know, he, he first initiated with uh, a sword, cut the gentleman's ear off, and when he saw that the rest of that's not where we're going, he fled with the crowd. Uh, you know, he denounced Jesus at the trial. Here it is. You know, he's with another crowd, another group, and they're around warming themselves by the fire. And when asked, uh, do you know this guy? You're one of them. You're one of his disciples. He denied even knowing Jesus. Why? Well, the crowd, that's where they were, and that's where his faith was. And it even says that on that third time, Jesus even looked at him. We see that in the Gospels. Uh, but what happened after? Even after uh, the resurrection, we see... Uh, Peter wrestling with Jews and Gentiles. When he was around Gentiles, he lived a certain way. Wherever that crowd was, that's how he lived. When the Jews came around, he lived like a Jew. Whatever that crowd was, he was. Until finally both crew, groups came together, he gets confronted by Paul, saying, what are you doing? You know, he was easily swayed by the crowd, that, that, that it moved in him in such a way greater than what Jesus expected. And this is why I believe Jesus asked the question, do you love me more than these? You see, I don't think it was Jesus saying, hey, you know, you, you got a higher love than these guys. You're, you're better than them, or they have a higher love than you, and they're better than you. I think what Jesus is saying, let me ask you the question. Does my love, your ability to be influenced by me, supersede any other relationship that is around you. Do you love me more than these? He says, because people that are around you, groups that you're around, sometimes they're going to encourage you and lift you up. Other times, they're not going to do that. And Jesus asked the question to Peter and to you and I, do you love me more than these? And Peter comes back with the response, I have a conditional love for you, Lord. Literally, literally communicating. When Jesus asked, do you have that unconditional love for me? He comes back with, I have a conditional love for you. When it's convenient for me, when the setting is right for me, when the circumstances are right for me, I'm your friend. Who wants that fair weather kind of friend? I appreciate Peter's realness here. I appreciate the honesty of Peter here. When Jesus is asking, and I appreciate the soft nature heart that he has. And when he asks him the third time, he feels it because he knows it's not right. Peter, you know, his goal, our goal, as well as Peter's goal, is to be like Christ. He's at the forefront of who we need to be. You know, we have to have an unconditional love. 
Why? Well, God has an unconditional love for us. And our love has to be unconditional. You know, I think Peter understood that. I believe Peter understood that there was the nature of who this Jesus was, was one of grace and mercy. But he also knew that he was full of truth. And his understanding of Christ's grace, his mercy, and his truth, he knew there was no better place to be than in conversation with Jesus. So he jumped out of that boat and swam to Jesus. Why, why do we know this? Well, the Bible speaks of the nature of God. In Exodus chapter 34, beginning in verse 5, we see Moses, one of Moses' interactions with God. And God comes down and, and, and goes past Moses. And watch how the Bible describes who God is. In verse 5, it says, Then the Lord came down in a cloud and stood there with him, speaking of Moses, and proclaimed his name, the Lord. In verse 6, And he passed in front of Moses, proclaiming, The Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands and forgiving wickedness, rebellion, and sin. Yet he does not leave the guilty unpunished. He punishes the children and their children for the sin of their parents to the third and fourth generation. We have grace and truth. And Peter knew it. But listen to how the Bible describes our God. He said our God is filled with what? Compassion and grace that we serve a gracious God, one who's slow to anger, abounding in what? Love and faithfulness. This is why even in the midst of Peter, knowing he has messed up, knowing that he has totally been wrong, he jumps out of the boat to rush to Jesus. Why? He knew he was filled with grace and truth. He knew, yeah, you know what? God does not leave the guilty unpunished. But he banked on what? God's compassion and his graciousness. Why? He watched him go to the cross. He watched him get arrested. He watched him beaten. And he witnessed the resurrection. And he saw that one, all that Jesus went through to get to the cross, never complaining, never arguing, but driven by an internal love for those who did not know him. He watched him die. And then after all of that, three days later, he came back. And he didn't come back with vengeance and hostility. He came back with love came back with grace, mercy, and truth, and, and Peter knew it. But he also knew he was wrong, and he was conflicted. He didn't know how to handle it because Jesus asked him, am I even your friend the third time? And then Peter is, is left there saying, Lord, you know all things. And he's allowing himself to fall on the mercy seat of God. In verse 18, when we get back to John chapter 21, look at what, what Jesus says. Verse 18, he says, Very truly, I tell you, when you were younger, you dressed yourself and went where you wanted to. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and lead you where you do not want to go. Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death in which Peter would glorify God. Then he said to him, what? Follow me. Follow my example. Follow me. Look, Peter, you're going to go through it in this world. He says, when you're younger, you're going to get to do a lot of things you want to do. But as you grow older, guess what? You're going to be led to where you don't want to go. You're going to be led to a place that is going to put fear in your heart. And what does he say? Follow me. Follow me. I mean, Peter is sitting there and he's hearing it from the Lord how he's going to die. And he's not saying, hey, it's going to be okay, Peter. No, he's saying you're going to have to go where you don't want to go. But he says, what? Follow me. Follow 
my example. You know, Peter was called to follow Jesus. That is the call of the hour for all of us as disciples of Jesus Christ, to follow his example. That, that No matter what the conditions, we must follow Jesus. The life he would live would bring glory to God. You know, you notice what he says here. He says, you know what? The way you will die will bring glory to God. Well, what is he saying? He's saying the bottom line is you're going to have to go to places you don't want to go. But I'm asking you to go through it for the glory of God, not the glory of self, not the glory of your goals and your dreams and your ambitions. He's saying, I'm asking you to lay down your life just like me for the glory of God. Think about Jesus before he went to the cross. Didn't he say, he says, Lord, now is the hour to glorify your servant. What was that glory? A horrible death. But he said, this is to your glory. And now Jesus is standing in front of Peter and he's saying, guess what? You're going to have the opportunity to bring glory to God. But in order to do that, you're going to have to go where you don't want to go. Just like me. Follow me. Jesus showed his grace through Peter's life. You know, when you think about it, he's having this conversation with Peter. And what does he say? He says, when you're younger, man, you know what? You're going to get to do what you want. When you get older, you're going to have to deal with the stuff that's plaguing you. And, and, and here it is, God's grace. God's saying, hey, I'm giving you a lifetime to work on it. <laughs> you know, God's grace. God's like, I'm here with you. I'm hanging in there with you, man. Hang in there with me. And I'm asking you to do what you don't want to do. I'm asking you to do what you're afraid of. For what reason? for the glory of God. And we see God's grace here saying, you know what, some of the things that we're gonna be working on are gonna take us to the end of our life. To the end of our life. But Peter, throughout the duration of his life, because he made it, he kept his eyes on Christ. You know, as disciples, we gotta keep our eyes on Christ. We've gotta be able to look. He, he loved us. We are his beloved. Therefore, we must look at his life model his life, model his heart and his convictions throughout the duration of our life, that our life may bring glory to God. Now, it's also interesting, you know, we got this unconditional love, but also uh, we have to love as he loved. His love was unconditional. Guess what he's calling us to? We got to love the same way he loved. And what does he say? Jesus says, well, if you love me, Peter, then do what? He says, feed my lambs. And Peter said, well, you know, I'm your friend. He goes, no, no, no. If you love me, Peter, care for my sheep. Notice he says sheep and lambs. You know, lambs, well, what's a lamb? It's one year old. It's a baby. It's a baby sheep. And he says, look, if you, if you love me, take care of the young sheep. Take care of the young Christians. I, I, I want you to feed the lambs. I want you to nourish and take care of the young followers uh, of Christ. We care for them. And he says what? Care for who? The sheep. Well, what are the sheep? These are the adults, the older folks. You know, it's not one or the other. Jesus says, if you love me, you're going to feed and care for my flock. You're going to feed the young and you're going to care for the older. Yeah, there's, there's something to be said here that Jesus understood that if you're young in the faith, you need to be fed. And when you're older in the faith, you need to be cared for. That there's a maturing process that comes together through our collective effort, our involvement with one another. And we have to love as he loved us. And he's connecting the two. Do you love me? Well, then, you know, love my sheep. You know, well, where do we get this from? Well, in John chapter 13, verse 34, shortly before the death of Christ, what do we get? He says, a new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must, what? Love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you, what? Love one another. Simon Peter asked, he said, Lord, where are you going? Jesus replied, where I go, you cannot follow now, but you will later follow. You see, he's already setting them up for this. Verse 37, Peter asked, Lord, why can't I follow you now? I will what? Lay down my life for you. Jesus answered, will you really lay down your life for me? 
Very truly, I tell you, before the rooster crows, I will, you will disown me three times. I mean, here it is, right? <laughs> you know, now all of these passages come together. Shortly before Jesus' execution, he, he says, look, here's a new command I give you. Well, what is it? Love one another. By this, all men will know that you're my disciples. By your what? Love for one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. And it's in this that Peter says, well, no, man, I, I, I want to die for you. And Jesus says, really? Will, will you? Will you really lay down your life for me? And Jesus says, oh, you will. But not right now. But what is it? What is Jesus trying to convey? That we're a part of the family, the family of God. And that uh, we, we have to have a Christ-like love for each other. When we look at one another, they are our beloved. And that we will likewise, as Christ laid down his life for us, likewise do the same for each other. Until when? Until we pass. That is our life. You know, a couple of weeks ago I preached a sermon about as Jesus was preparing to get close to the garden and uh, talked about our suffering and our pain and we work it out in prayer. Well, after that message, uh, Janine Shoemaker sent a text. Um, and here's, here's a portion of what she sent uh, to me. Uh, and this is the section of it that after she said, you know, I'm, I've entered into great pain, making reference to the sermon that I preached that day, and that when we're in great pain, we, we wrestle with God in prayer. And here's a section of that after she mentioned that she'd entered, entered into a time of extreme pain. And she said, looking forward to coming out on the other side. The other side being seen in the heavenly glory of God and being wrapped in his comfort. This is a text message I got from my sister. A couple weeks later, our sister has passed away and she's gone on to glory. But I love the fact that she kept her eyes on Jesus. That in the midst of suffering, she understood the other side. And the other side of that suffering wasn't victory here on earth, but it was victory in heaven. And as we celebrated Janine's life, um, so many people shared how much she gave to them, how much love, consideration, and care she gave to the flock. Everyone was lifted and encouraged by her spirit and by her selfless acts of love, the agape love that edified the body of Christ. And then for her own battle in the last few days, she said, I'm coming out on the other side. And she had joy knowing that what? She would be wrapped in God's comfort. The only reason why, brothers and sisters, we have this hope is because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Brothers and sisters, I love you. Let us all be thankful for what God has done in Christ and raising him from the dead. I love you and have an incredible day celebrating the resurrection of Jesus Christ.
It's times like these you learn to never can. It's times like these you give and give again. It's times like these you learn to love again. It's times like these, time and time again. Oh, 